This is Street Knowledge with Chris Graham. Welcome to Street Knowledge. I am Chris Graham. I have Scott German with me uh, for the podcast talking UVA football. We talked UVA basketball yesterday. Today we're going to talk about the, the Wahoos getting ready for surging Boston College. And uh, so, so Scott, uh, this team is five and one. This Virginia team is five and one. One more win, and already bowl eligible. Uh, who would have thought we'd be talking about this uh, when this season started? Well, not. I'd like to say, oh, I had all the faith in them in the world, but that would be an absolute lie because I was very skeptical, to to say the least, that this team would would figure out a way to win more than maybe two or three games, but they have, they've surprised us, and you're right, they're one win away from uh, bowl eligibility, and at this point in the rebuilding uh, of this football program, uh, we're, we're looking at that bowl with whatever that bowl is, if it's in Annapolis or wherever, that's, uh, that's as important as this program is going to the Rose Bowl would be. Yeah, and uh, so you don't overlook the chance. We know we've talked, Scott, about how the schedule gets really tough in November. So uh, a, a game against Boston College, I call them surging Boston College. They, of course, the, the, the Eagles beat uh, Louisville last weekend, 45-42 at Papa John Stadium. So, uh, and a team that also played Clemson pretty tough a few weeks ago. Uh, a 3-4 and four team, 1-3 and three in the ACC. Uh, but uh, this is, you know, Virginia's a seven-point favorite heading into this game, so you don't want to overlook this opportunity, to, to say the least. If you're the Cavs, you're at home. It's homecoming. Uh, a chance, uh, you know, you would maybe expect a bigger crowd than we've seen uh, this year. I don't think we've cracked the 40,000 mark in attendance, but, you know, you got to hope that, you know, I guess that's something we could talk about. you got to hope that the fans are starting to pick up on the fact that this team is doing a lot better than any of us thought, and, and maybe more people will, you know, not, not disguise themselves as empty seats, I guess, on Saturday. We hope, and, uh, you know, the weather's looking like it's going to be an ideal fall afternoon, not a, not a hot not a hot day at all, just perfect, perfect day, game time's 1230. Um, you still got plenty of your day left after the game. You know, it should be uh, the biggest crowd of the season. Hopefully it will be. Um, you know, we can talk about these empty seats and our theories behind them. I think we pretty much know the theory behind them. But, uh, uh, you know, chance Saturday for the fans that have kind of been on the fence to come out and take a peek at what's, uh, what's unfolded so far. And uh, two, two teams that, according to Coach Mendenhall, listening to his uh, <coughs> telephone uh, or his um, weekly uh, press presser with the fans last night, uh, a team that, kind of resembles Virginia in a, in a way in that uh, they clearly have a, a footprint, clearly have a, a mold of the program that they want to be, and uh, they're starting to uh, implement it pretty pretty well. Their record is very deceiving. They're 3-4. and four. They beat Louisville at Louisville. Not a, not a, a Louisville team that was, um, as far as I know, uh, had their Heisman Trophy quarterback. Uh, they were tied seven at all in Death Valley against Clemson, or that game may have been played at BC. I'm not sure. That was, that, was that, was a, that was a Clemson, yeah. So you know, three and four—that's a very misleading three and four team, and it's going to be a heck of a heck of a challenge for Virginia on Saturday. A great, great game. Now, I'll, I'll give the other side of the BC story, and not to down them at all, to say the least, because this is a tough team. You just mentioned the two, the two tough losses they suffered. As they, as they go to three and four, Steve Adazio is in year five of his program, and there is actually talk uh, up, up around Chestnut Hill and, and the, the environs there uh, that this may be his last season. Uh, you know, year five of a, of a rebuild. Uh, they, the, the Eagles went to a bowl last year. They, they finished six and six in the regular season, went to a bowl for the first time in a long time there. Uh, but this year's team at three and four. Now, you know, I guess we talk about this, Scott, in the context of of a team that needs a win, uh, they lose this game, fall to three and five. You know, finishing three and one down the stretch becomes a tall order for this program to get back to a bowl. And the expectation from the folks who who follow Boston College football closely is that uh, Adazio can't backslide this year. He he went to a bowl last year. Uh, if the, if this program falls below that threshold, 
this could be the end. And in fact, if you you know pay attention, maybe his last two or three weekly press conferences uh, is kind of reading in between the lines a bit. But uh, he's sort of setting the stage for well, you know, we don't have great facilities here. You know, we don't have great practice facilities. You know, it's hard to recruit here. Uh, and he's he's maybe you, you know kind of subtly saying. I've done a good job. I think I've earned more opportunities, even if I don't win six games this year. Please don't fire me. Uh, but that said, yeah, this this team certainly, uh, you know, going into this game, if they win their four and four, two and two to finish out to get to six and six, a lot more realistic for that program than three and one. So a huge game for the Eagles this weekend in that context. Well, definitely. So they're kind of maybe playing for their coach's life, but uh, you know, you know, the story about BC. I have some some ties to that program. I have a relative that teaches there uh, at Boston College, and uh, they are, so, you know, kind of a head scratcher as to what the ACC, other than what we all know, the almighty dollar, as far as getting that ACC television footprint up into that northeast part of the United States, but. Uh, don't know how much that's actually helped the conference or not as far as attaining viewership that they can turn around and stake to their advertising rates as how much they charge advertisers. But BC is so far buried on the Boston sports map that they hardly even have a pulse ever uh, because Boston is a, is a pro town and you've got the Fable franchises, the Celtics, the, the Bruins, the Patriots, for those that don't know, New England is a, a Boston team. They play in a suburb of Boston. Um, the Red Sox, I mean, BC is just a non-component in that, in that market as far as sports. And it's relatively uh, academic, good academic school. You know, it's a tough place to play. I have actually been to a football game there in their stadium, and it's it not. It's among being charitable. It's among the least uh, um, favorite, at least as far as the the character character of the stadium. Probably among the least in the conference. It's not a big stadium. It's just. Uh, um, you know, they're, they're, I don't know what their practice facility is, is like, if they even have an indoor facility, but it's a tough place to win. And um, I think he came there and the program was pretty downtrodden. Now, five years, I guess that's kind of the benchmark. If he hasn't turned it around by then, but according to Coach Mendenhall last night, you know, he stuck to his game plan. And, uh, and they've taken five years, and now you might start seeing that – shift to where, you know, they start winning some football games. But my gosh, at Clemson, at Louisville, that's a, that's a tough road to have regardless of who you are. And see, uh, thinking back to when Boston College came into the ACC, it was around the same time that Virginia Tech and Miami came in. I think, in fact, they all came in at the same time, uh, what, 2004, 2005, somewhere in that range. And BC football back then, actually, the basketball program was also top-notch then. It's also been downtrodden for several years. Uh, but the basketball team was an NCAA tournament team, and the football team had Matt Ryan at quarterback. Uh, they, they, there was that memorable game, I want to say it was in 2006 maybe, when BC played Virginia Tech on a Thursday night, and they were both ranked in the top five in the country. You know, uh, Tom O'Brien, of course, the former Virginia assistant coach, uh, was, the, was the longtime coach there. They went to a bowl every year for something like 9, 10, 11 straight years under O'Brien. I mean, it was a long stretch where they went to bowls. Uh, when O'Brien left to go to NC State, uh, a, a guy named Jeff Jagodinsky took over for just a couple of years. Uh, in fact, he was the coach in that uh, BC-Virginia Tech game I talked about where both teams were ranked in the top five. Uh, and uh, he, uh, had a, he had some interest in NFL jobs. BC fired him for showing interest in those NFL jobs. And... Not coincidentally, maybe you know the, the the coach the quality of coaching has gone down. The recruiting suffered, and they're they're about what nine ten years now, kind of like Virginia in a lot of ways, uh, into you know falling into the into the abyss. Just last year, getting back to a bowl for the first time in a long time. Um, you know, you talked about the Boston market. That's the danger that conferences have, college conferences have, when they try to go into a, a pro sports town. You know, you want the TV market, like you said, Scott, Boston, you know, the TV market that it is. 
Uh, you want to get into those TV markets, but when you get a pro sports town, you know, if you're, if you're in Charlottesville, if you're in Blacksburg, if you're in Chapel Hill, uh, you know, what, uh, uh, Tallahassee, you know, you're, you're the game in town. You know, that, that, the, 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 the college team is the game in town. That's your pro team. You're in Boston, yeah, you're fifth or sixth or tenth or whatever you can be on the list. And uh, uh, that's, that's the tough part about bringing those big markets is that you bring in a big market, but they're, they're not really on that radar there. And that, 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 that all factors in, I think, into the interest uh, in the program and then the ability to recruit. You know, you, you talked about the stadium being so small, the lack of practice facilities. Uh, it's, it all, I think it all goes together, honestly. Oh, absolutely. My my relative, it was, we had that conversation, it wasn't recently, but it was so not not that long ago. Uh, she said to show you, give you an ending, they did a poll in Boston about the awareness con- uh, factor of the sports teams, the pro and con events. BC Sports fell below the Boston Marathon. Uh huh. Uh huh. I can say that. And that's a one. That's a one day event. Once at one time a year. Yeah. Uh, and BC Sports is pretty much year round. So you know, yeah, they're probably if you had to rank them categorically or numerically, I'm sure that BC Sports, BC football, uh, is going to be down around nine or ten as far as the consciousness of the Boston sports fan. We'll talk about this this BC team and what it's doing this year. We mentioned three and four records, the close losses, or, or the the tough, the, the good performances uh, against some good teams, and then the win over Louisville. Uh, last week, A.J. Dillon, 272 yards. He's a true freshman running back. 272 yards, four touchdowns. Uh, 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 Boston College puts up 555 yards total offense. Now, they did give up 625 to Louisville uh, in, in the win, 45-42 win. Last second field goal that won the game for them. Uh this year, uh, the defense is giving up four, 445.9 yards per game, uh, 242 yards a game on the ground, 5.4 yards per carry on the ground. So, uh, you know, that defensive effort last week was really no fluke. You know, Louisville, obviously, the, you know, the reigning Heisman Trophy winner, Lamar Jackson, but, uh, you know, they've been giving up big yards to everybody this year. Uh, and their quarterback, Anthony Brown, a redshirt freshman, and he struggled. Now he's a guy that was being recruited by Virginia Tech. I remember uh, when they were coming, when he was coming out of high school. Uh, the uh, offensive coordinator there, Scott Leffler, former Virginia Tech offensive coordinator, and uh, Brown was a, a top target for Leffler. Uh, he's compete, completing just 51 percent of his passes, uh, seven touchdowns, eight interceptions. You know, an issue for Boston College. You know, they got the running game uh, at least ramped up last week with AJ Dillon putting all those yards up. But from a from a skill position or skill player standpoint, uh, as far as receiver tight end, maybe not so much talent there. Uh, and it kind of makes it a challenge for Brown, the, the new quarterback, uh, to do his job. So uh, it's a team that will be largely one-dimensional. Uh, they'll run the ball an awful lot, and if they don't have success running, uh, you know, you'll you'll be able to shut them down. Now, unfortunately for Virginia, that's one area, the one area. If there's any vulnerability defensively for Virginia, it is on the, on the ground. Uh, last week, Carolina runs for 211. We also saw. Uh, even back to William & Mary. William & Mary gained some yards on the ground against Virginia. So not that Virginia's defense is, is struggling. The, uh, the defense gave up 312 yards a game. But if you can't hit them in one place, it would be on the ground. Uh, so uh, if Virginia is able to figure out early how to shut that running game down, uh, you know, it could be a long afternoon for BC. And you know that that's probably the emphasis that that's going on in practice is to concentrate, focus on shutting down that running game. But at the same time, you know, you, you don't expect BC to come out and just, you know, if abandon it. They're going to have to pass some to set, set up the running game a little. They're going to have to have some sort of a passing attack. So, you know, and, and again, they come into the, to the game, they got to be just overflowing with confidence. I mean, you beat Louisville at Louisville, uh, all of a sudden – the thought of beating Virginia, that's not all that of an opposing thought if you're, if you're an oppo- if, uh, opposing a team, rather. So um, I'm certain that BC is not going to come into Scott Stadium thinking, you know, we have no chance of winning this football game. They're going to get, UVA going to get BC's best shot. Probably the way we're going to be talking about that the rest of the season, if you look at the, the way the schedule unfolds. Uh, there are no easy games. Oh yeah, this 
this is the start of a, a stretch. You got BC, Pitt, you got uh, Georgia Tech, Louisville, Miami, Virginia Tech to finish things out here. One stat that I don't think fans, uh, I didn't know until I looked it up. I, I was trying to get a sense of how Virginia's defense ranks ACC and nationally. And uh, Virginia's ranked fifth in the nation in pass defense efficiency, a 99.1 opponent passer rating. You know, watching the games, you know, you knew that the op uh, opponents were having a hard time throwing the ball against Virginia. But uh, fifth in the nation in pass defense efficiency. And uh, you're going up against a quarterback who's struggling to connect with his, his receivers. Uh, you know, it's almost like, yeah, if you're, if you're game planning you know, Bronco Mendenhall, uh, you keep doing what you're doing, but you can, you can put some wrinkles in maybe to, to try to slow, you know, some run blitzes and things like that to try to slow that running game down. Uh, Virginia also uh, seventh nationally, and we knew this kind of going in, but I, I didn't know the, about, about the seventh nationally part, but uh, allowing opponents to convert just 26.8 percent of third downs. Uh, that's that's you know if you stop the run on first and second, you can stop the run on first and second down and make them throw uh, you know third and long passes. Uh, that's how that all adds up. So uh, you know Virginia offensively, then the running game's gotten going. We've talked about that for a couple of weeks. Uh, the, the BC run defense, not very good, as I mentioned. Give up 5.4 yards per carry. You can see a game plan there from Robert and A and his staff. Hey, let's continue doing what we're doing there. Let's run the ball. Uh, give uh, Kurt Baker, uh, you know, ahead of the chains down. Better second downs, better third downs. And uh, really allow for, uh, you know, that, that more of a ball control type offense like we saw last week in the win over Carolina. Which, which might... Might dictate the way that the defensive schemes are called. Again, you just don't, you know, it just depends on how BC wants to challenge. I mean, if BC comes into this game, they'll just sit there running away and the team, you know, don't, look, don't be surprised that they're not working on some something in practice this week that may open up their passing game or may at least try to open up the passing game a little bit. I've kind of learned from watching enough football, you know, it's not always what you expect and what these teams come out with uh, on, on game day. Another interesting, another game that we seem to be getting some respect out in Vegas. Uh, Virginia's a seven and a half point favorite. Yeah, yeah. Uh, boy, I tell you what, we, we're quickly gaining some gaining some believers out in out the betting world, it, it seems like. Well, yeah, yeah, you know, that's a reflection of, uh, you know, a couple of road wins, too. I mean, it's the home game, but you win at Carolina, even though Carolina's 1-6. and six, You know, that's not, it's not easy to go on the road and easy to see and win. You win at Boise State. Uh, you know, and this is a BC team. Going into the season, you know, Virginia was likely to only be favored in two games. You know, in fact, before the season, they were only favored uh, when you looked at the long-term schedule. Uh, the ESPN Power Index, the way it can, you know, project out how your record's going to be. It had Virginia favored against Wayman Mary and against Boston College. Those were the two games. And uh, uh, so this is a game that on your schedule, no matter where you thought this Virginia team would finish out this year, this was a game that you had circled as a, as a winnable game. Uh, now that we're halfway through the season, uh, you know, it's, we, we, know, we know where this Virginia team is. We know where the other teams in the ECC are. Uh, you know, it's it's certainly there. This this is a game Virginia, uh, you know, needs to. I think almost it's it's kind of weird to say we, we we you know we don't have experience with this the last several years, but you know, I don't I doubt that Bronco Mendenhall lets his team look too far down the road. But these are college kids. They you know they, they can you know their their attention spans are what they are. You don't want to overlook this team uh, because this is a very this this is a game that if you overlook this team you can lose, but. But boy, you know, if, if, if you go out there, you do what you need to do for three hours on Saturday, uh, you know, it really sets up the second half of the season for Virginia to do something special this year. Yeah, you can't you can't look at look at games anymore and say, This is a this is a sure win. I'm sure Louisville fans were thinking before the season, before even before the game, the kickoff yeah. that that game against Boston College was a sure win. Well, that didn't turn out that way. Uh, Clemson, so, and I yeah. really believe that, that Mendenhall, his, just his overall approach to the game, if we lose Saturday, and that's certainly within the realm of a possibility, I don't think it's going to be because we were we were not prepared or, or we were overconfident or anything like that. I think it's going to be just... Boston College was better on that particular day. I executed the plays better. Uh, but, you know, you're right. You win, you can't help but to look ahead. You're already bowl eligible. So 
So every game from there on out is just icing on the cake. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you. So we talked about some of the keys to the game: Virginia establishing running game, taking away BC's running game. Uh, those are the, really that's those are the to me the two big keys of the game uh, is is controlling the line of scrimmage and, and establishing that early on both sides of the ball. I would say a concern I've got. And I want to get your thought on this, Scott. Uh, a concern I've got is is that to me the, the the only way you really lose this game is if if you're loose with the ball, if there's turnovers by the Virginia offense. And this offense has only committed four turnovers this year. Three interceptions by Kurt Binker. He lost a fumble last week. So four turnovers, all by Kurt Binker, as it turns out. First loss fumble of the season was late last week in that win. Uh, Virginia's defense held and, and won the game after that turnover. But that's the area that, you know, and not that Boston College is a ball-hawking defense or anything of that nature, but it's, it's the potential for sloppy play is the only thing that concerns me. I think if, if Virginia plays a clean game, uh, it's hard for them to lose, but it, it really the last couple games out, the Duke win, the uh, you know Baker threw a pick six uh, last week. Again, the fumble late that, that gave Carolina a chance, at least at the end of the game, to, to maybe drive and win the game. That's the only thing that concerns me is that potential, again, for the for the turnover. And uh, I'm going to get your thoughts on that because... You know, it, it's hard to get, it's hard to nitpick that much. Four turnovers in six games is is a great uh, you know a great ratio for your offense. But I don't know. I just feel you know the, the four sacks last week, the fumble last week, that pick six two weeks ago. You know, I, I am nitpicking, but it does concern me a bit. Well, and hopefully that was just some hiccups. Uh, I listened to the game, and, and I think Vegas the, the point spread to do the seven and a half. I think this reflect what. What you need to do, and I think the only, and I agree 100%, the only way Virginia loses this game is to get beat badly in the turnover game. Toss up the ball, then Kurt throws some ill advised passes, it gets picked off, these kinds of things. If the offense goes out and simply does not lose the game, goes out and just plays a, just a, a very even kill game, no, maybe one turnover, hopefully it's not an inopportune time, but it, this is a game where the offense just takes care of business, goes out and plays uh, a well game, uh, a well played game. Don't have to put up gaudy numbers. Then Virginia wins, and I think that's the reason Vegas has them as a seven and a half point favorite. They don't have to go out and score thirty five points. They just need to take care of the ball. No unnecessary, no no turnovers, sloppy, you know, offensive turnovers. Uh, and they should win that football game, and I think that's I hope, and I believe that's what you're going to see. I think it's going to be, I, I would use the word workman-like effort. I don't see Virginia going out and winning this game 45 to 10. Although I would love it, it would be great. But I see the evolution of the way this program is going to grow, continue to grow under Coach Smith and all. Is they're going to go out? It's going to be a close game, but they'll win because. They just took care of the ball, didn't have any unnecessary turnovers, and, and the offense didn't lose it for us. Yeah, so you segued into where I wanted to go, kind of, kind of wrap things up with the podcast, into the predictions part of the podcast. Uh, so, yeah, you're, you're saying, you know, close, you know, kind of workmanlike game. Which, what, you know, give us, give us a score and give us the uh, rationale. Well, for those that are keeping score, I'm, t- I'm too straight. <laughs> a little off in the prediction of the Carolina game, but still got the the... the, the ultimate winner, right? Uh, I'm going to say in an, in an ugly-like game to most people that would look at the game, but not to us UVA fans, I'm going to say UVA 23, BC 10. Uh-huh. And ugly in that it, it, it's close, close until the fourth quarter, but BC never really threatens to, you know, to win the game. Virginia just goes out and does what they need to do to win the game. Uh, but I do believe that Again, take care of the ball, play just steady on offense, play a good normal defensive game that we've seen the last two or three outings, and Virginia wins 23-10. Yeah, you've uh, you, you got me there a little bit. My, my, the score I had in my head from the, from the moment we started the podcast here was 20-10 to 10 Virginia uh, with a similar rationale. I think that Virginia I, – I think the game plan offensively is going to be to more emphasize ball control. So, uh, you know, I don't see – uh, you know, a lot of a lot of you know passing up and down the field, and you know, big big plays necessarily out of the offense there. I, I think you're going to see more of the drives, like we saw a couple of drives against North Carolina. You're going to want to see Robert and A with you know, 10, 12, 15 play drives. Uh, you know, controlling the clock, controlling the the, the game on the ground. 
uh, Baker kind of picking his spots uh, to get yards in the air, move the chains as needed uh, through the air. Uh, and de defensively, I really think that the Cavs will control the line of scrimmage early and make it really hard for Boston College uh, to, to sustain drives on its side of the ball. Uh, so 20 to 10, I think it feels right to me. So we're both we're both pretty close there as far as that goes. I don't, and I think I expect the same thing as you, Scott. I think it'll be a game where, it, it, to me, it kind of feels a little bit like the the William and Mary game early this season. You know, a lot of fans probably looked at that final score, said 28 to 10. We only beat you know a pretty bad uh, FCS team 28 to 10. What's the issue there? If you watch that game at all live or on TV or whatever else, uh, the game plan was pretty vanilla. Uh, they went out, won the game, did what they needed to do. They didn't need to be too flashy. They just won the game. I think something similar this weekend, uh, again, I think, you know, probably a, a pretty basic game plan. Let's just go out and win the game. Uh, and, uh, and, and I, and I kind of see that, that being the same case. I think the biggest difference between your prediction, 2010, mine, 10 is, Chris, you just drastically are underestimating our kicking game. <laughs> Well, you're I believe three. that we just we get a field goal. We can go down and kick a field goal sometime in that game. Well, twenty. The, the most likely way to get twenty three is three field goals, right? So, uh, well, right. well, that's what I'm saying. Three. We can kick a field goal. Our kicking game is improved. So, yeah. uh, I'm only giving that's why I didn't stick with the conventional seven point scores like twenty one ten or twenty eight to ten. I said twenty three because I believe you're going to see some field goals. Well, we had two last week, which doubled our season total. So. Uh, yeah, and I saw earlier this week in, uh, in Bronco's uh, uh, press conference on Monday, uh, he was asked the question, so where do you feel comf comfortable uh, kicking field goals this year? Now, of course, the long for A.J. Mejia, the, the uh, freshman kicker, is 28. Uh, both of his field goals last week were within, the, within 28 yards. Uh, Mendenhall said uh, that he would feel confident. In fact, he said going into last week's game, they felt confident 25, at, at, at the 25-yard line, which will be a 42-yard kick. Uh, and he said, you know, just like with any coach, it kind of varies week to week based on field conditions and the wind and that kind of thing. But he said he'd feel good most weeks out to 45 yards on attempts. Now, last, and he said last week, too, you know, we, we were thinking about this. I know I was thinking about this during that last drive that Virginia had, uh, the one that ended with a fumble by uh, Kurt Binkert. Uh, Virginia had a first down, I want to say, right around the 20-yard line, uh, on uh, the Carolina 20-yard line on that drive. Uh, got that... Uh, uh, the clipping penalty that knocked it back to about the 33, I think it was, for that third down play. Uh, you know, I even thought Virginia might run the ball there uh, to try to gain four or five yards and set up a field goal. And, and, and Bronco said that there was a thought to that, that, that you know, if, if the, that uh, third down play had not worked out the way it did where Virginia would have, you know, fumbled the ball away, that if they had gotten inside the 30, they were going to try a field goal there. So, uh we haven't seen a field goal attempted that long this year, uh, but uh, but it sounds like that they have more confidence in AJ Mejia than we've seen all season long, uh, and, and that's probably a good note because you, you're going to need to make some some medium and, and longer range field goals if you're going to you know play some close games down the stretch. Yeah, and remember they see things in practice that we don't see that on game day. So they, I think that this put this way, I think I'm not. Certain this is their mentality, but maybe this is their mentality. The coach's mentality is gone from we can't kick field goals to we'd rather not kick field goals. So that is an incremental improvement uh, um, to just say, hey, if we have to, we think we can kick one from 35, 40 yards. But earlier in the season, that would have never taken place. Yeah, you know, it's, it's one thing if it's fourth and one or fourth and two, and you're at the 20-yard line, and you say, hey, I think we can get two yards here. Let's go ahead and go for it. It's another thing if it's fourth and ten, you're at the 19-yard line. You know, you need to be able to kick that 36-yard field goal. If you can't do that, you know, going for fourth and getting 10 yards on one play when the defense knows you need the 10 yards within that short part of the field is really tough. So, so yeah, you know, it's it is it's incremental, it's process, it's it's progress, and we'll take it. Uh, this program's growing up, you know, kind of fast uh, as we've seen. So, uh, you know, the kicker's a freshman and. Uh, Bronco and staff have more 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 confidence in him as the weeks go on. That's good to see. So, uh, you know, hopefully hopefully a game winning field goal isn't in the cards this week. We got some you know some some games down the stretch where we might have that be the issue. But let's hope it's not this week necessarily. <laughs> no, and if you not if you haven't got tickets yet, buy some tickets and come out because the work, it's a great great venue uh, and they need this. Virginia needs to support.
support. The fans should support what the effort that's gone into this season. I think that'll wrap us up for the uh, podcast here. For Scott German, I'm Chris Graham. Thank you for, for listening to the podcast, and we'll just remind you real quick that uh, coming up on Saturday, Scott and Josh Simmons will be live blogging from the press box at Scott Stadium. Uh, kickoff is after just afternoon, I think a 12:20 kickoff officially, uh, but they'll be live blogging. I'll be at VMI doing uh, uh, play-by-play for the radio for VMI's broadcast, so I won't be there for that. But, of course, after the game, we'll have everything you can imagine uh, in terms of the game recap. We'll have stats breakdowns. We'll have game columns, etc. cetera. Um, so that is something to look forward to for Saturday. Uh, but in the meantime, again, thanks for listening today, and we'll talk to you again soon.